Welcome to the Holy Smokes Podcast, a show about faith, friendship, fine tobacco, and drink. I'm Steve Ryder, and I am at Paul and Mary Felitas' place, the official opening of the Conclave, Friday night, and we've got, how many people would you say, estimate we've got here? Probably, I'd say, 50, 70, 80, 80? All right, so... A little bit down because we're doing it in September, probably the weather's cooler, but yeah, we got a good turnout and I have a guy here that I am excited about because I've had a handful of people tell me you got to get Jim on the podcast. So Jim Canfield, welcome to the Holy Smokes podcast. It's good to be here. Uh, I've been to Paul's place a few times in the last few years. It has been uh, shoulder to shoulder a few years. And it tends to get busier as it gets later. So I, I think we'll get I think we'll get there to those numbers you expect. The rain may be daunting folks a little bit. So, Jim, first question: What you smoking? I'm smoking um, the Gateway cigar that we always give guys who come to the treehouse. It used to be called a Dirt Torpedo. It's a Drew Estate cigar. It's very flavored, sweet coffee, little Java. They've rebranded it. To work, to, they've spelled the name natural backwards on it. It's the cigar that got Luan smoking cigars. Mm. So this is what we give guys in their first, if they're new to cigars, to kind of ease them into it. How, how much are those things run? About six bucks. They're fantastic. Wow. Now, Drew Estates has rebranded these yes. as Sweet Bottom Bettys or Fat Bottom Bettys. Ah, it's the same flavor, I the love- same cigar. So they've unbranded this and they're doing so much better with the rebranding. And that's a hell of a, because I have a Fat Bottom Betty here in my mm-hmm. case, mm-hmm. and it's a lot more expensive than six bucks. Yes, they've done a nice job with the rebranding and repositioning it, yeah. So, so this, those things are available still? So I don't know. When they were going okay. out, I bought a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm stocked for a while. Got so, it. And I got them at a, at a little bit of a discount because they were trying to get rid of them. Nice. Yeah. Dang, if I would have known fun. that, I would have gone crazy. I, and, I, and I did go crazy, so I have some, if you'd like some. Well, I would. Because it well, would take you. a lifetime to smoke all the ones I have. Nice. All right. So, Jim, where would you grow up? I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. As a Cardinal fan. I grew up in a church that was, or a family that was uh, church going, but did, were not believers. Okay. Look at what kind of church did you guys go to? We went to a Disciples of Christ church. The one my grandfather went to, the one my mother went to. Yeah. The one my father faithfully went to every Christmas and Easter. <laughs> so, St. Louis, what kind of family did you, what did your parents do, siblings? Dad was an entrepreneur. He's a serial okay. entrepreneur. Mom was housewife, tennis player, one sibling brother, younger than me. So we were a very athletic family. We were a competitive family. We were, dad liked to conquer vacations. Uh, we, we would, <laughs> Give me an example. An example is, you know, every kid grows up and whatever their childhood is, it's normal, right? Yes. We all think our childhood was normal no matter what went on. Yes. Our normal vacation was we'd get the Ford Econoline van, we'd take out the back seat, put in the sofa mattress in it, the, the pull-out sofa mattress, where we'd crash in the back. The the cooler between the two captain's chairs up front was filled with sandwiches, so we wouldn't have to stop. And so dad would drive the thousand miles to Colorado. And so instead of stopping and changing drivers when he got tired, we did what I call the midair transfer. <laughs> dad would put it on cruise control. He'd get up out of his chair, hold the steering wheel from behind the chair. Mom would slip in and the car never stopped. I thought that was normal. Because we didn't want people to pass us. You yes. Know? We had the CB radio. We were, we were aggressive. We were talking to people. We were, you know, whatever we could do not to waste any time. Efficiency was important. It's funny as hell. Yeah. And so my father has not changed a lot. Efficiency is still important. Really? Yeah. Nice. Well, so you said athletic. Yeah. What'd you play? What'd you do? I grew up with tennis and swimming and went into baseball and basketball. And we always did skiing as a family. Nice. So those are kind of my sports. Yeah. yeah. What do you do still? Do you do any of those still on a regular my basis? My body lets me do a little bit of tennis or pickleball. But mostly just gym stuff. I need to get back into swimming. I'd like to someday. But I'm mostly a hiking, working out in the gym, elliptical, just trying yeah. to figure out ways that my, yeah. I can get my body to go another 30 years 
right? I'm 59. Yeah. To keep going and enjoy that. I challenge you. Mm-hmm. Take that number up 40 years. Yeah. Well, 120 is God's limit, right? Scripturally, 120 is God's right. limit. Okay. Okay. All but, right. But so, even there. So, so where then? Yep. Does Isaiah 65 in with, fit in with your theology where someone who dies at 100 will be thought of as a mere youth? Well, if we're all living to 120, then there are mere youth at 100. I don't know. Maybe that's in heaven. Maybe that's beyond. Maybe that's the next life where we think, where we think that. Where do they go then when or, they die? Or in that time, it was when they died before Jesus and went to Abraham's bosom to paradise and live there. And if you were just 100 years old, okay. you, were, you were a mere youth. All right. I challenge you on that, but okay. All right. So St. Louis, mm-hmm. what'd you do after high school? Went to college. Where at? Vanderbilt in Nashville, okay. Tennessee. Yeah. And then went into the, prayed, asked the Lord to, I became a believer at 15. So at, how a, did that happen? at a Christian athletic camp in Branson, Missouri called Canacuck. Very near and dear I, to my heart. I love Joe White. Yeah, Joe White is amazing. We chatted the other week, I, I, and, and he's just, I, he's such an encourager. I, I, I worked with him for years at Focus on the Saturday Night Great Call-In Show, Life on oh, the Edge Live. Oh, neat. And I love Joe White. Yeah, I, just wanna, I just want to give you a big hug right through this radio. I just want to give you a big no hug. No one has a bigger heart than Joe White. He's a believer in people and a belie- and just loving people. He's, just, he's an amazing human being. Yeah. And so you were at Canacuck. How'd yeah. you get to Canacuck? So before we were believers, we went to the local country club and there was a family there that said, yeah, you need to send your kids to this Christian athletic camp. Cause we were just, you know, we were just all athletics and so forth and running around. So we tried it one year and it was fantastic. Yeah. We were there for a month. And yeah. I think my parents thought, well, this is great. We're without our children for a month. This yeah. is fantastic. Right. Yeah. And so after, at the end of camp, the last three days, you probably know, they preach the gospel. They tell it to the families, right? They've been doing it to the kids. Tell them about what a personal relationship with Jesus is, which I thought was kind of poppycock early on because I'd gone to church all my life. Why did I need to do this ask Jesus into my life thing? And so I heard that for four years. And the fourth year I said, fine, I'll show them and I'll show God too if this is for real. And so I asked Jesus into my life about five times a day for two weeks, just to make sure <laughs> that my test was thorough. And gradually, I, things in my heart and things in my head started changing. Lots of my I have tos became my want tos. And I saw my heart change and my attitude change and a peace come over. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's real. And so that was the beginning of a great journey. Is this a pattern in your life that you know you, you do things thoroughly? Five times a day for two weeks. <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't know if that's the case, but certainly if I want to disprove something, I want to be thorough about it. Yeah. Yeah. So And be, and be right about things. So you're at Vanderbilt then? Yep. After, after high school? Yep. For college? Yep. What were you studying? Electrical engineering and math. Well, okay. actually, I probably studied more wiffle ball and foosball. Those were my probably true majors if you measure my time. I did not, as Mark Twain said, I did not like the classroom getting in the way of my education, right? So after college, I was, there were a number of things I was looking at doing, and I was praying God to close the doors on all of them. And one of them was learning to fly. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, who's going to teach me how to fly the best? I want to be excellent, because God wants us to be excellent. Well, the military. Well, which branch of the military? Well, one gets a runway to land on, and one lands on ships. It was pretty much that simplistic. I walk down to the recruiter's office and I tell them I'm thinking of doing this. They said, bring us your transcript. I did. They laughed out loud. It was so bad. They said, we'll take our test. I took their test and they go, oh, clearly you're an underachiever. (laughs) And I was like, thank you. (laughs) So me going in the military was, you know, a lot of my life is timing and this was timing. And Um, what year was this? So this was 1986. So in 1986, Reagan was in office. So if you remember Get Smart, the beginning of Get Smart, he goes down an elevator, some doors open in different directions. He walks through the old TV series and they all close behind him. And that's very similar to what happened to me with my circumstances going into the military. Reagan was in office. He was building a 600 ship Navy, the 15th carrier battle group. They needed planes. They needed pilots. They lowered the bar like the military does. And I stepped through. (laughs) And behind me, two months later after I signed up, 
Top Gun comes up. The window closed, and everybody wanted to be an aviator. And the the qualification they could actually have people that were more qualified than I was join. So yeah, Top Gun Be- because of Top Gun May of 1986. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So you got so, in just before that, just in the nick of time. Yes. Meanwhile, John Ramstead, who has been on the broadcasts, that movie was what yeah. what really got him into mm-hmm. wanting to be a Navy fighter pilot. Yeah. So. You go to the Navy. So obviously John was one of those smart guys that came in after me, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so did that for about eight years. And what'd you do in the Navy? In the Navy? So I ended up flying a, something called an A6 Intruder. And they're out of Whidbey Island, Washington, is the West Coast. The Navy always has a West Coast squadron place and a East Coast place where they locate the planes. So Whidbey Island was the West Coast A6 Naval Air Station. Yeah. And so the A6 was an all-weather attack jet uh, that was carrier based yeah so like John I have a number of carrier landings about half at night so yeah. just a great honor and privilege as a kid to be able to you know you couldn't we were always kept saying we can't believe they're letting us do what we get to do yeah right? we're 26 27 years old right yeah oh. so eight years you were in mm-hmm. any particular memories from that time that really oh, kind of stand out stories oh, I want to hear some stories so K, if we're in a group, K yes. always asks me to tell the story of my call sign. Yeah. So in the Navy, you get a you get your call sign by either an evolution of your name, or you did something wrong, you screwed up. <laughs> so I my last name's Canfield, and then it was Cornfield, and then it was Corn Dog for a long time, and then it changed to Zorch on one fateful flight. <laughs> what happened on that flight? So on that flight. I was new to the squadron, and to zorch is a verb that we use in the Navy to fly low and fast over things, if you're going to zorch over something. kind of has that burning effect, but speed effect. Yeah. Um, and so it was, a, it was a low level that we were doing, one of the classic low levels in the state of Washington, which are just gorgeous to do. Um, on this particular day, the first four uh, points of this low level are typically closed because it's so through the cascades and they're usually foggy. Well, on this day, they were clear. So it was probably my only my second time doing this. So going to point A, point to, so, and at point Charlie, there is a silver fox farm. And when you fix, when you uh, design the route and, and figure it out, there's always notes to say you need to avoid this town, you need to avoid this place, you need to avoid this silver fox farm. It's a noise sensitive area. So this was a very noise sensitive area right on the top of point Charlie, because the gentleman that lived there had been in the the Vietnam War, and he was a special forces guy, and there was a price on his head, and they told him to kind of get lost in the woods, and so he did in the mountains of the Cascades, raising silver foxes for pelts and so forth, and coats and so forth. But apparently if you fly over it and it's really loud, the silver foxes tend to eat each other. Oh my gosh. So he, he appealed to Congress, please make them fly two miles away. We had to fly two miles away and 1,500 feet high. We had to kind of do a big U-turn, kind of a big... Yeah. Uh, uh, detour up, around yeah, it. Yeah, up and over. And on this particular, but on when you fly on a low level, you're kind of like not exactly point to point. You're enjoying the scenery. Yeah, yeah. You're finding the little crook, nooks and crannies to fly through and fly over. Right. You're kind of practicing your little your tactics and so forth. So on this particular day, we were enjoying ourselves after Point Bravo. Going, and I said to the, my bombardier navigator, "Hey, we, would you put Point Charlie on the nose? Because I, I knew we were supposed to avoid it. Well, as he did, it went it, or put it on the the, the, went, my my navigation, it. It, no, no, it went right on my nose, so I knew it was right ahead of me, and we went right, o- as soon as we went over that ridge, as soon as it trued up and I knew I was right on top, there was the house yes. with the chain link fence and the little kennels around the edge of the, the fence. Yes. So we were not two miles away or 1,500 feet high. We were full speed, 50 feet over the top of his house and in his backyard where his pen was. So you asked too late. Way too late. Yeah. Pulled the power back, but it was too much. And it wasn't just me. I pulled another plane with me because I was leading a two-plane. So we went and finished our flight. It was a fun flight. Dropped our bombs. Flew back through the... There's something called the VR-1355, which is just a gorgeous route through the... You've seen some of that scenery in in the latest Top Gun Maverick with the the snow caps and flying through that. It's an amazing, amazing scenery. So we get home, and I keep waiting for the boom to drop, waiting for the boom to drop, and nothing happens. Two weeks later, I'm in, they call it, it's kind of a ground school for the base, a refresher of what are the rules of the road, 
what are the noise sensitive areas? Stay away from this area, stay away from that area. And oh, by the way, you guys have got to be more careful. We had somebody fly right over the Silver Fox Farm recently. Next to me is my XO. And he starts cussing under his breath. I don't know why, but I know that he's not happy. And so after this is over, I said, well, I got I to tell him. So I go up to the XO and say, XO, that was me. And he's like, oh, no. All right, I'll call Chuck. You know him? Oh, yes. Chuck Walters has the silver foxes. You know, we're in VA 155, and our mascot is the silver foxes. It's named after Chuck. Chuck was good friends with the first skipper of the squadron when it stood up, and every skipper after that has become good friends with him. Oh, no. So fast forward a little bit to in six weeks, there's a change of command. And who comes to every change of command? Chuck. Chuck. So Chuck comes, and we all four of us run up to Chuck. Sorry, sorry, sir. We really blew it. And he said, well, I didn't make an official complaint. I just called in. You just, you know, I haven't had a close encounter in a long time. So just be more careful. Uh, I'll, see, <laughs> I'll see you after, after the, the, the ceremony. I said, okay, sir, thank you. Thank you. So he's got the, and he's coming in. He's a burly guy. He's got the special forces beard still going, right? He's looking the part. And so after the change of command, we went back to the officer's club where they all, we all kind of yuck it up. And then Chuck gets on the chair and he stands up and said, could I see all the officers in the pool room, please? And the pool room is a closed area. So we all go in. He closes the door. He's got a little baggie in his hand like you get from Safeway. And it's got some things in it. And he asks, officers, Casper, Bauer, Canfield, and Young, please come to the front. So we all came up front. And Chuck had, Chuck said, I had a recent had a close encounter, and I would like each of these gentlemen, like you guys to take one. And he holds, he opens the bag, he holds it at arm's length as if he was scared of what was inside, and says, take one. It's and one so of the we, dead we, silver we, foxes. We each pulled out a dead silver fox tail that I think he has dipped in mink oil or whatever. And so it is extremely stinky at the time. Yeah. And so that silver foxtail, any time that I got it out and touched it, I could not get the smell off my hands for about four days. Oh my I gosh. tried alcohol. I tried gasoline. I tried all the different soaps and sand and dirt and charcoal. Nothing. Yeah. It, would just, it would take days for that to get off my hands. So as a result, I got the call sign Zorch. Zorch. So that can't be your only story. There are lots of stories, and I glory in my weakness. So this, the other stories are um, other times I, I excelled. There's a mission uh, that we do to, to help us play with the Air Force. And we take off from Whidbey dusk, and we go up and hit a KC-135 tanker. Or excuse me, it was a KC-10. And the KC-10 has uh, the Air Force and the Navy have different refueling philosophies. The Air Force has a boom that a guy drives through a little window and plugs it into a receptacle into the Air Force jet. In the Navy, we have a probe that we plug into a basket, so the pilot is in control of doing that. And so there is a device that they attach to the boom on the Air Force plane, the Air Force tanker, that is nine feet long. It doesn't have any inertial reel in it like the the Navy apparatus does. It's about four inches thick of a hose, very stiff, and a giant basket that you plug into. So this is my first time plugging a KC-10 at night. And so we went up, and my skipper was on my, was I was on his wing, and he plugged very easily, got his gas, and left. And then I went in and plugged and fell out, and plugged and fell out, and plugged and fell out. I finally got tired of falling out, so I said, okay, I'm going to make sure I don't fall out this time. So I get up there, and I, I don't fall out. And I keeps kind of creeping up f- forward. And I pull a power back and it keeps creeping forward. And now there's a big loop. There's a big bend in this stiff, this hose. And now it's becoming a loop. Well, there is a certain design shear point on the end of the, at the boom point. And sure enough, I got close enough where it, that now tight loop sheared. And then the, all the, the tension came unfurled and it came through my canopy <gasps> when it came off. What? We measured it and it missed my helmet for about, by about three inches. Wow. And so now I'm flying a convertible at 20,000 feet. So fortunately, it's not the front windscreen. It's the side windscreen, which are thinner. Yes. And so we flew into 
Ogden Air Force Base. Landed, had to wait. The Air Force guy said, oh, I knew when a Navy guy was, was calling for an emergency, it was, it was something real. You wouldn't believe what these Air Force guys do. Um, so Skipper came down, landed. You guys okay? Yep. Yeah, okay, we'll come send you a new canopy later. That's the end of that. I end up flying the jet home. Fast forward 20 years. There's a, a air museum in Sonoma County in, near Napa. It's called the Pacific County Air Museum. And they have been requisitioning parts from a guy in the Pentagon to help them put different parts of the plane together. The guy in the Pentagon who was kind of knew the A6 was my bombardier navigator for a year or two. Yeah. So when they said, when we need to paint somebody's name on the plane, whose was it? So they painted his name and they painted my name. So I went down there for this inauguration. Unveiling. Yeah, no unveiling. Good word. And so I ended up staying with this guy's at this guy's house. He's an enthusiast. Just, you know, yeah. he's in a fireman, but he's an aviation enthusiast. He's got buddies. They put these old birds together. They paint them up. They make them look fantastic. Yeah. And I told him this story that I've just told you. And he says, you know what? There was another guy the same thing happened to. I said, really? It's kind of unusual. He goes, oh, yeah, hang on. So he's got all the air power, air journal, war journal, warbird planes all back in his closet. He's one of those guys. He pulls one out. He knows where it is. He opens it up and said, see, there's a guy he landed with. It's an A6. He's got a probe, a nine foot, ba a basket on, the, on his probe and a nine foot hose hanging off the side of his plane. See? Well, no, that's not another guy. That that's, was you. That's me. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was I was immortalized in some magazine somewhere <laughs> as I glory in my weaknesses. <laughs> So after the military, then yeah. where'd you go? I left the military. I got married while I was in the military to a Navy widow um, mm. who had two kids. So they were 11 and 14 when we got married. And we had our first and something happened to my wife. She became very anxious. Our daughter was acting out, was making very interesting decisions. So we were having a difficult time knowing what to do with her. And then my uh, wife at the time became very anxious. So it became time to leave the Navy at that point. So it was circumstances that kind of drove me out. I couldn't, I didn't feel right going on deployment and leaving for six months at a time. Her hands were full and her mental yeah. capacity, something had changed. Yeah. I and mean, so we went back to St. Louis at that time and left. Um, we had our second child and it didn't get better. She ended up um, becoming suicidal Ooh. and ended up on psychiatric meds. Didn't want to do the counseling, didn't want to do exercise, but just wanted to stick with the, the psychiatric meds. Mm. I became very lonely. I remember driving home, crying, not knowing what to do. I was the Christian. I could wear the mask. Everything was good. I didn't have any problems, right? And so I didn't know where to turn How old um, were to you ask at the for time? help. How old were you at the time? At that point, if Eddie's seven, am I 33, 32, 33-ish? Mm. Um, and how old were the kids? Uh, the kids were, Becky would be four, Eddie was one, um, and the older kids were um, 12 years older, so 16 and 19, mm. the two older stepkids. So our 19-year-old daughter, we'd already asked to leave the house because she couldn't, she couldn't follow rules, she can yeah. continue to bring, and yeah. we were sacrificing everything to be just with, to deal with her, sacrificing yeah. the other kids. Mm. So that was a difficult time. But what happened to me was when Eddie gets about three or four, um, I don't know what to do. I'm uh, and, and backing up then knowing I got involved with pornography before I became a believer. And that really sunk into me and took a really a grip on me. So my acting out and escaping was with porn at that time. And but it I, thrives. It thrives. It flourishes in loneliness. Right. And I was lonely and I didn't know what to do and I didn't know who, how to ask for help. And the porn ended up not being enough and I found a friend at work oh. and ended up stepping outside of my marriage. Mm. And I ended up doing that several times. Mm. And so I finally got to the point where I was sick of myself. How did you reconcile your faith with doing that? I didn't know what to do. I, you know, I said, I know this is wrong. I'm feeling guilty. I'm feeling shame. You know, we're going to church. So it's, it was very difficult to reconcile, but I'd always battled that and just, it, it kind of coexisted the shame and my uh, acting out yeah. with my faith. Yeah. And it was there before I got there. And so I felt trapped. 
Mm. I felt in great bondage. I felt like this, I'm always going to be this way. That was my escape. Yes. When dealing with pain in my life. And so I got to a point where I was sick of myself and said, I'm, I, I got to do something different. You know, doing the same thing, expecting different results is, is going to be, is insanity. Yeah. Yeah. And I got to a point where I could not stop. And that's when I knew I had a problem. Mm. I felt that I could always stop and manage it before then. But now I realized I could not. And what'd you do? I, at that point, uh, I confessed everything to my wife. That probably didn't go over very well. It didn't. Um, and so, and most guys only confess what they have to because of a crisis. I hadn't had the crisis. I hadn't gotten caught, but I was just sick of myself and said, I'm, and I just shared everything with her. Ended up going to a, a weekend immersion, ended up getting in counseling, confessed to my pastor. Uh, then it was, began a, a journey of, and lust was not my own. And realizing, I thought lust was my issue. And it's not my own, it was not the only issue. And when it, you know, Charles Spurgeon said, if you bail on a boat, but don't fix the hole, it's like only dealing with a single sin in your heart and not your yeah. whole heart. Yeah. And so we needed to, I needed to deal with my whole heart. So at that point I dealt with my deceit, with my lying, yeah. with my lust, with my, anything that was offensive to God. And I said, I, this is not who I want to be anymore. I'll do whatever it takes to get right with God and for God. You, and, but I said, God, you have to fix me. I can't fix me. I need help. So it's really the first time that I, in my life that I said, I can't, Yeah. and I need help. And so it was a great time of learning hu humility. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the counseling, confessing to the pastor, having a, yeah. uh, con uh, confessing to my accountability yeah. partners, I'd been lying to you for the last 10 years, you know? Mm. Um, so a very difficult time for us mm -hmm. as a family. I remember getting yelled at every day for nine months, you know, just the wound that I gave yeah. my, my spouse. And so we got to a point where I was, she said, I, I don't remember being happy. Last time I remember being happy was in Pacific Northwest. So that was 16 years prior. I said, she says, I want to go back. I said, okay, if you think changing our location will change our hearts, I'm open to doing that. So I was feeling fairly free of the bondage. I remember crying in my counselor's office feeling free, not feeling like I had to act out, mm. um, feeling safe with a computer. There was a long time I didn't feel safe with a computer. I yeah. didn't want that. All right, I turned off TV. I turned off movies for a year and a half. I changed all the inputs into my life yes. to do whatever it took to change, to starve my eyes, to starve my mind, to starve my body and whatever it took to get, um, to get right with God, to, get, to, get, to deal with the bentness in me. Looking back... Do you think you would handle that different had you been able to go back and tell your younger self to, okay, this, this, this is how right. you should do this? Right, right. Yes, and I've told guys, I said, you need, you know, sharing with a wife, you know, do it out of love. What is, what is love? Well, how would love confess to your spouse? And some of the counseling that I've got is that you, you need to kind of be free of this for about six months before you do your confession, if you can help that. Go start the counseling on your own. Go start sharing with your friends on your own. Go start telling the truth on your own to your buddies. Go start bringing people around you that can be praying for you yeah. and that you can be honest with yeah. and be accountable to and dealing with that and get on a path that's you're getting clean and you feel like you've, you've had a little success, then go in and say, I've had a problem. Here's how I've dealt with it. I'm on the track to recovery. Yeah. That would have been a much kinder way to have dealt with my spouse at the time. Mm. So we get to Seattle and I've been clean for five years and I present to my spouse, it's time for you to get healthy. It's time for you to get counseling. It's time for you to pursue health in exercise, in finding a friend. And I want you to go out, go out weekly and find a friend, get a job or volunteer, give back, do, interact with adults. Um, How was that received? Um, and uh, uh, she refused to do all of that. She said, no, I've got my drugs. I don't need to do counseling. I don't like to exercise. This, my doctor says I'm going to be on psychiatric meds the rest of my life, and that's, that's all I'm going to do. So at that point, I started to lose hope. 
wasn't sure what to do. And at some point, I really feel like there was something inside me that happened. I don't know if it was God releasing me or I had a psychological break. I don't know. Yeah. But at that point, I, I pursued divorce mm. and knew that I couldn't stay in that misery. And I realized that she didn't love herself enough to do that. She didn't love me enough to do that. And she didn't love us enough to do those things. How old were the kids at this point? We left my daughter, who was a senior, in St. Louis to finish her senior year. My son was a freshman in high school. Mm. And so he finished his freshman year and was in, into the sophomore year, kind of that time frame. How did everyone handle that? How did your so the girls, now ex-wife the, handle that? The, the, when I told my ex-wife that I wanted a divorce, she said, well, you said you'd never say that word unless you meant it. I said, that's true. We agreed we would never say it unless it was, it was time. I told my daughter, you know, when you get back for the holidays, your mom and I might not be living together. She said, Dad, I told my friends that when you guys get a divorce, I'm having a party. Why? Why? Well, it was, I was happy and deeply saddened at that moment because she saw the just the tension. She saw in the, the house. tension and the dysfunction and the relationship issues, right? And so, yay, she knew it wasn't all a mystery. But oh no, I've it was. We led such a bad marriage in front of her that that's how she felt about it. Oh. The girls, both girls, my oldest, my oldest, oldest daughters, my stepdaughter, both my and my and my younger daughter said, "Yeah, we knew it was coming. We understand." My son was completely blindsided. Really? Yes. And just that surprised even the, his sibling, even the even the, the daughters. So he he had his struggles and didn't and the issues with processing that as well. Yeah. Hmm. So then I moved into the a place called the treehouse that we affectionately call now the treehouse, and God gave me that house. And then there's a number of different ways that that happened. Talk about it. Um, so, because, because it's a pretty central part of Holy Smoke Seattle yeah, now. Yeah. The so Seattle I'm, area is mm-hmm, a Yep. And we're going to have Buzz on and you mm-hmm. in an episode that's right. coming up right after this yep. one to talk about those guys that are in the Seattle area yep. and what you guys are doing over there. Yep. Yeah. So I had been looking at flipping houses and so forth. I had tools that online tools that I'd subscribed to that told me what was coming up, what was short sailed, what was going to the courthouse and so forth. And this, I look, I saw this house and it just struck me. What year I was is just this? Drawn to it, 2012. Okay. And so I'm looking at this house. It's a short sale. I know that a short sale, having been a director in a bank at one point, I knew a short sale needed to take time. So I, I put in a bid on the house. And so I waited and I eventually saw that it had was going to the courthouse steps. And I told my realtor, you're going to lose your commission in two weeks. You, the buyer, the seller's broker and the um, inside broker, the, the um, short sale negotiator that I'd uh, agreed to sponsor. And so they all started panicking. And we tr- the day came that it was going to the courthouse steps and um, we were waiting for it to get pulled. And it didn't. And I went to the bank that morning and got the cashier's checks. And I'd already done a dry run and watched one of these Saturdays happen. Yeah. And so I went there and stood there in front of the guy, found the guy that was selling the house. I'd had to find, I was, I'd borrowed some money from a family member, but it wasn't quite the right amount. And so I had to grab a hard money guy to join me. So that was kind of a part of the adventure. And so together we put our money in and the agreed. And so we started bidding with another a gentleman that was, against this and eventually I got the house ended up paying less than what I'd put the bid in for so praise God right so <laughs> great education and that, that paid off so that house did some work on that house it was a triple flag lot so there were two lots behind me one right on top of the house I noticed that they were owned by a trust you, go on, you have online tools in Seattle so I didn't worry about it too much until two guys came to my house one day and said tell us about your lots in the back what are you talking about? You know, the lots you have for sale. What are you talking about? There's no signs in the yard or anything. The next day, a couple walks up into my driveway. Can I help you? They're gazing up into the woods. Yeah, tell us about your lots. What do you mean? Your lots for sale that you can build on back here. I said, well, you may want to check to see that it's, it's kind of steep land. So I immediately called my real estate buddy and said, what's going on back there? What's happening? He said, oh, you've 
and you've got two lots that are for sale. And I said, oh no. And they were no longer owned by a trust. They were owned by Word of Life Ministries. So what had happened? The trust had donated the land to the ministry, right? So I kind of surmised that. And I said, well, tell me what's going on with these lots. Well, they've been pending for three times. Oh no. And they've all fallen through. Why have they fallen through? Well, feasibility, interesting. Let's put a cash offer in on the, the one behind me for a low ball rate, and that's all I want. And so they, they came back and said, nope, you gotta buy both lots. I said, I understand that. Okay, so I gave them a pittance, for, offered a pittance for the, the second lot. And so they kind of negotiated back and forth. We were $5,000 apart, and I went to bed in a huff in, the, in my negotiations, because I was hard-nosed negotiating for this. And the Lord woke me up. Do, do you take after your father in that? I'm trying to. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm a mere shadow of his negotiating ability. And I, the Lord woke me up in the morning and said, "Really, I'm giving you these lots for this little amount of money. You're five thousand dollars apart, and you're really going to dicker over it. And it's a ministry." I go, "Lord, you're sorry. I'm sorry." And I repented, got on my knees, and I repented, and I went downstairs, picked up the phone to call my realtor, and he was calling me before I could dial. And he said, they'll take your offer if you pay closing costs. And I said, done. And so I knew that God had given us the land. Mm. So Buzz came over, and you'll talk to Buzz at some point. Buzz came over, and we staked the land. I said, what does staking the land mean? Well, he brought four boards with points on the end, and we wrote verses on them. And we prayed over each of them. And then we went to each corner of the, the land and staked them in and declared that this was for God and declared it his territory mm. and for his purposes. Mm. And so that's when... And Holy Smokes had already started some degree at, before then as just Buzz and I on the front porch. When I came to Seattle, I called Joe White and I said, who's your guy, your Men at the Cross guy? Because I went on his website and he said Seattle and he, had a, he just said pending. So I go, maybe he's got a guy. So he said, my, bo- my guy is Buzz Leonard. And he says, hello in about 30 minutes. I said, all right, sounds like my kind of guy. And so I met Buzz. Uh, and we hit it off immediately. I was, I had no friends and he was, I think, in need of some friends as well at the time. So we bonded well. He came over and taught me how to smoke a cigar. So that was the first time I learned to smoke a cigar. Yeah. Um, we did it on my porch every week. And then another guy came and we started talking and hanging out. And a fourth guy came and the porch got too small. And so then we tried to do a fire pit somewhere and it just didn't work out. And so I built the landing out behind the house. And it's become where Holy Smokes has started. So then we, we had about eight guys regularly, and that started about six years ago. We have about 25 guys every Tuesday. Like Paul, we do. We, we, that's when I decided we're going to no, do it every week, yeah. every Tuesday. Whether anybody comes or not, they just know. They can come here, and I'm going to be here, and somebody's going to be here, and we're going to have a fire pit. The fire's going to be going. We'll have a cigar. We're going to have red wine, and we'll have some food, and we're just going to hang out and be men and share what— and what goes on here stays, what goes on at Treehouse stays at the Treehouse. Mm. And so the, my prayer for the Treehouse every week is that God's peace and his presence would reside there. And folks have come and said they've gotten healed. Some folks have come and said that God's met them there. Mm. Some guys have come and said, I never knew anything like this existed. So it's, it's been a wonderful journey. Buzz Leonard has been a great help with that, a great host, co-host with that. And we've, we've created a team of guys now that kind of host. So when I'm gone, it still goes on. They still open up the house. They still set up and they still clean up. So it's been a wonderful journey to transition in, into that. And I love opening my house up. I love giving back. I, I love to see what God is doing. I'm just a shepherd of my uh, a house, a steward of my house and the land that's back there and what, we're, what we've built. Mm. And so it's just it's great to give guys a place to go. And in, in Seattle, public smoking is outlawed. So there's no... Public cigar. There's no cigar room you can walk into. There, there, a few casinos will have it, but they're kind of distant on the edges of the, mm. of the city areas. Mm. So, and we don't have anybody with a cigar room in their house. It's not like Colorado Springs, right? And I'm not sure any city is like Colorado Springs that has that. And we have a backyard that uh, is, is for that purpose, for guys to meet and for hopefully for the Lord to mix among us and to lead in healing and helping their lives. We have uh, several clergy that join us. We have a Messianic rabbi, Presbyterian minister, and an Anglican priest. The Anglican priest used to be a swift boat driver up in Vietnam, so he's an interesting character. We have a lots of uh, we have entrepreneurs. We have 
all sorts of different folks that show up. Carpenters, laborers, it's just, it's just a great mix. Young and old, 22, 23 is the youngest, and 82 is the oldest. It's a great, that's a great. It's, it's just a great mix, and it's a great yes. support. You sit yeah. next to the guy next to you and say, what's your story, right? Like we're doing now. And maybe there's something I, can, I'm, I need to offer him or something I'm supposed to receive from him. You know, you just wait and see what God has. So if any listeners are going to Seattle or they're in the Seattle area, be sure to reach out to Jim in mm-hmm. the Facebook page mm-hmm. or Holy Smoke Seattle chapter group on Facebook as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I love the Seattle guys. I've, mm-hmm. I've only been up there once for Holy Smokes and it was over at Rob's place. I think you were there. I may have been there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of northern. That's a very yeah, northern yep. of Seattle and we're kind of yeah. east of Seattle. Yeah. yeah, we're on in St. Louis. You don't want to be on the east side. In, <laughs> in Seattle, you want to be on the east side. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. One more thing. I say okay. if, the, if there's right. if the, if there's a guy who's yeah. who's struggling with sexual purity in his life and wants and and feels it's has him entangled, he's welcome to reach out and talk because we need support. Hmm. And there is hope, and there is hope in the Lord to, to yeah. be able to be free of our bonds yeah. and be have peace um, and freedom from the chains of sin. I can personally say having freedom from that is, it's an incredible feeling. It is. It really is. And I didn't think it was possible, and it is. Yeah. Let's get to rapid fire questions. Do it. Hey, everyone. I wanted to announce that we have Holy Smokes gear. That's right. We have swag. We currently have hats, shirts, stickers, like for your vehicle or your travel humidor, magnets, even branded bourbon glasses for a limited time. Go to holysmokes.club and click on the shop tab. That's Holy Smokes. Dot club. I'm super proud of the shirts. They're made with Bella Canvas shirts that are soft and incredibly comfortable. The hats fit wonderfully, which can be a problem for those of us with big noggins. We plan on having a lot more to offer, like Guayabara shirts, additional t-shirt designs, beanies, polos, hoodies, cigar accessories, and much more. Check it out. And even if you don't make a purchase now, be sure to sign up for that email list as I've thrown a couple big discount coupon codes for those exclusively on that list. So click the shop tab at holysmokes.club. Thanks. Rapid fire. Fire. How's that stick treating you? It's good. It's a bad ending. (laughs) You mentioned when you first tried cigars with Mm -hmm. Buzz. Mm Mm-hmm. That was usually my next question. Do you ever do pipe? Once or twice. Haven't done much pipe. Favorite cigar? I really like the one I have right now. It's uh, it was first as a, dirt, a Drew Estates Dirt Torpedo. It's been rebranded as the uh, uh, Sweet Bottom Betty's. They have a torpedo and it tastes the same. So I know they're rebranded. It's the same company, but it's it's great. It's a nice flavored cigar. Most expensive it's, cigar you've ever smoked? I smoked a fifty dollar cigar. Somewhere once. Was it worth it? I wasn't a connoisseur enough to be able to tell the difference. Best dollar for dollar cigar you get? Oh, this one, the one I'm smoking right now. Six bucks. It's fantastic. I love it. I think the rebranded cigar is about twice that, about 11 or 12 bucks. Yeah, it is. Where's your go-to place to get your smokes? So I've been having fun on cigarbid.com. It's a great place to buy fun cigars for two bucks or less. When you're celebrating, what's your splurge cigar? That's a great question. I like a Partagas Series 4D. If I can get a Cuban, that, that's one of those. I favorite, like that. Favorite liquid pairing with your smoke? I'm kind of a sweet guy. I like sweets, so screwball, the screwball whiskey, that's kind of, a, you know, I like my flavored cigars and my, you know, they're not, they're not, the, the purists would laugh at me or scowl. Who cares? But it's, but it's, cares? But, but it's what I like. Yeah. We all have different tastes. Yeah. Most interesting person you've ever met through cigars. Oh, man. Probably the Anglican priest that comes to our group who was a swift boat driver up in Vietnam, taking the special forces up. Then he became a diver. Then he was, and with that diving, he was a treasure hunter and went after Spanish doubloons and those kind of things crazy that's freaking cool oh it's so cool and then he gets the call of the ministry and becomes an anglican priest <laughs> in his 70s that's so he's he's a deep person he's a thoughtful person he loves men 
and he has a heart for men. He's oh. a great guy. Most memorable cigar experience. His name's experience. Stephen. Stephen Morrison, if you're listening, this, is, right. to, this is to you. Nice. Most memorable cigar experience. Most memorable cigar experience was the Holy Smokes cruise to Cuba. Ooh. So I don't know if there's one cigar, but it was a series of yeah. riding in those 1950s vehicles with the dropped-in Toyota diesels with the super sounding stereos, the high powered air conditioning, the powered windows in the front, the vinyl seats, all the original vinyl seats with the can't open the doors from the inside on the back, a great kidnap car. And then going from the different vendors to from Partagas to Romeo and Juliet mm. to Cohiba and just kind of experiencing the Cuban cigar life. Best conversation over a cigar, that one or one in the treehouse, or one here at the Conclave or other. I've had so many good discussions with men on what they're doing and what their stories are. I'll stick with Stephen was a pretty good one. I enjoyed I enjoyed that. All right, the non non cigar questions: Marvel or DC, or neither? Marvel. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Sports teams? Are you into sports at all? St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, yeah, and so I've been converted to a Seahawk fan in, in Seattle. And I love the St. Louis Blues as well. Any athletes that you were a big fan of when you were a kid? I would assume oh. Ozzie Smith. Oh well, there Ozzie. Well, that whole team, right? So yeah. Ozzie Smith with Bob Gibson was great. You know, that I kind of yeah. grew up. My parents were fans, uh, Cardinal fans, so I knew you know those those names, uh, Vince Coleman, and yeah. and uh, just that those great those great 1982 World Series team was just amazing. Yeah. Well, Mark, that, you know, that, Mark- that, that that was a heartbreaker for me as a Brewers fan. Oh, yes. I remember going to school that next morning and crying during lunch. So you were celebrating and I was crying (laughs) as a second grader. (laughs) One of my more memorable games was in 1998. 1996 was the strike, as you remember. 97 was scabby and awful. We had a bad taste in our mouth. And two guys brought baseball back, Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire. That was electric. Watching those guys, it's unbelievable season. I mean, even though, looking back, steroids. It brought people back to yes. the stadium because yes. I, I remember with, with the yes. strike, mm-hmm. I was like, screw this. I'm done with baseball. If yeah. they want to do this, That's if, right. they, if they want right. to cancel the season, no right. World Series, yep. I'm done. That's right. And that's exactly what baseball needed. Yes. As, as, as did big of a black eye as it is, when you look back in history, it was really important for the game. Yes. And I hope because of that, he will enter the Hall of Fame. Yeah. To this, and and I, I got to go to the last game and watch him hit 69 and 70 with my daughter. With my oh, so that was, that was a fun memory. Oh, that's yeah. epic. Yeah. That's epic. Yeah. What kind of music do you love? love I love contemporary Christian music. When I became a believer at 15, I gave my ears to God. My brother told me, you sacrificed your musical taste with what I was listening to at the time. But I do love to worship and love the Lord. But other than that, 70s and 80s. Favorite bands? I mean, everything from Keith Green to Crowder to Chris Tomlin. Favorite food? Sushi and steak. We have what we call at the treehouse dessert. And dessert is the last thing we serve. And it's a fourth inch thick ribeye or New York strip. We start on the grill and finish in the oven. Mm. And it's a favorite of the guys. Mm. Dogs, cats, neither or both? Dogs. Nickname growing up or in college? Not your call sign. Uh, Not my call sign. Pretty much Jim. Jim, something of some variant of Jim. Corn dog was there for a while. What's one unusual fact that few people know about you? I'm writing a trilogy. Ooh, talk about it. So I felt God's compelling to write about uh, the story of a uh, different lens for Jesus. The, so it's the, I call it the progressive revelation of Jesus through the eyes of paradise. Paradise being where people went when they died before who the faithful in the Lord went before Jesus rose and, and opened up heaven for them. Mm. So the, my first book, which comes out around Christmas, is called Trouble in Heaven. What the hell happened there? Nice. So it's the story of the beginning of, of God and then ends uh, and, and the creation of the angels, the creation on earth. And then it ends with Abel alone in paradise, standing, uh, having crossed the chasm. Standing there alone, and Satan is building the gates of hell with his newly acquired power of death. Mm. 
favorite one to three books not titled the Holy Bible? Malcolm Ruggeridge's uh, Third Testament. I've recently enjoyed um, Elon Musk's autobiography. It's been fun to learn how he grew up. Mm. He went to the library and asked for a science book, and they said, I'm sorry, Elon, we have no more. You've read them all. <laughs> <laughs> Name three things that you're thankful for at this time in your life. Thankful for family, for friends. I'm thankful for the holy smokes in the treehouse. I'm thankful for my new grandson. I'm thankful for the business that I'm involved in. It's been a real reward What's for that? me to be part of. It's my first time as a CEO. I'm running a little startup. It's kind of a turnaround for the startup. The founder was let go and, they, and I was put in place, but my father's on the, is the chairman of the board. And so we're, we're doing it together. So he's kind of my mentor in this. Wow. And so it's been really special to be able to turn the company around and see it. We, we were we, you know, cash flow positive for the first time this last spring. And so we're, we're growing like cats and dogs. And so it's just a fun problem to solve and it's fun to do with him. Is your dad back in St. Louis? Dad's, or is in, he? dad's in St. Louis and he had a, a health scare um, a few weeks ago. And so we're just thankful that he's out. He's, we're, we'll probably have a few more years with him. So it's great. Mm. If you could be any animal, what would it be? Oh my gosh, I don't know. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> Early riser, <laughs> night owl or normal? Depends. I can do. I do both. I sometimes stay up late and I sometimes get up early, depending on what the need is. If you could live anywhere, where would that be? I love America and I love where I am. I, I think that's where the Lord has me. I love my friends there. I love what God's doing there, what God's doing in me and doing in others. What's your greatest strength and what's your greatest weakness? It's probably both. For many people, it is. I think it's both. I mean, it's... Uh, what is it? No, I think my greatest strength is loving people no matter what. I think that's one of the things I've learned, mm -hmm. right? Paul said he was chief of sinners, and that was because I hadn't existed yet, right? So I, I don't feel that anybody's sin is greater than or less than mine by any means. Yeah. So it, it, that allows me to love others because of what a God has done for me. The greatest weakness is that in that and my generosity— I can get taken advantage of sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm kind of like, that's an okay trade-off. Mm. I'm okay with that. Mm. Who's been the greatest influence in your life? Well, I got a great counselor when I went through my, my time who's, who's been a, an amazing influence. Probably my parents have been, you know, would be up there as well. Who's the first person you think of when you hear the word successful? My father. Ooh, Why? Just in what he's done with, he's a serial entrepreneur that has never failed, has always had, and it, it continued to grow. So I've just and admired him, and I've seen him grow in that. So success in his character as he's grown, as well as the success of, of how his, his strategy and how he's dealt with people. And You came to faith at 15. Mm -hmm. Did he ever come around, your parents? Yes, my parents came around about the same time. Really? Dad stayed in the business world. Mom went into something called Bible Study Fellowship and grew through that and ended up becoming a teaching leader in, the, in, in wow. that. So wow. it's, been, it's been a fun ride. What do you do for self-care to rest, to recharge? Uh, I like to work out. I like to stay physical. Nice. I travel about once a month. I just go leave. I go for, and the cause is usually something friends or family oriented. I just have my quiet. I enjoy my quiet time. I enjoy a cup of coffee and sitting out on the, the landing out behind the house and yeah. in the mornings and watch the sun come up and mm. the, the, be in the trees. It's called the treehouse because we have there's a lot of trees there, so it's just very pe it's super peaceful there. It's just a great place to recharge. Mm. All right, last three. What does Holy Smokes mean to you, and how has it contributed to your spiritual journey? Mm -hmm. You know, after my recovery from deep sexual sin. I wasn't sure God could use me anymore. And so it's an example of God allowing him to use me, to work through me, mm. um, to allow my gift of generosity and my and joy of being with men to kind of flourish. Mm. If you could have a holy smoke with any three people throughout history, living or deceased, who mm -hmm. would they be? Can't name Jesus. Okay. 
one of my favorite books. I love Malcolm Muggeridge. I know folks probably say C.S. Lewis or that or Tolkien or whatever that crew, but I like, I would love Malcolm Muggeridge. That's the first. Um, That's mm, a first. Mm. Now, he was part of that that ilk, that yeah. crew. I think um, certainly my um, grandfather, who, really? was, who was a cigarette smoker, and I would love to sit down and have a cigar with him. Hmm. Was that your dad's dad? My dad's dad, yeah. What did he do? He was a salesman in the plumbing industry, but he was also an alcoholic. Mm. And at his funeral, a lot of guys came up and said, it was your grandfather that pulled me out of the gutter, sponsored me, and I am who I am today because of him. Oh, so he... So he's a recovery guy, too. Wow. So I would love to sit down and chat with him about all that. Oh, well, how old were you when he died? I was right... I just left for college. Oh. Well, I'd cut their grass for the last 10 years mm. and took off to college. Then my brother took over. Mm. Last one on okay. the list? Yep. Oh, Teddy Roosevelt. One of my favorites. I'd love to hang out with Teddy. Critic and the man in the arena, right? Oh, it's one of the best just, speeches ever. Yeah, yeah. I've got just, that as my screensaver, or my, my background for my phone. Mm-hmm. That's a great one. And he was the one that first did the Navy, right? Took the Navy around the world, the global power. You know, walk with the strong stick. So just, just a great man's man. All right, last question. Okay. If we're meeting one year from today, mm-hmm. and I got a bottle of screwball, yep. and we're busting out that ribeye yep. that you guys cook up at the end of a Tuesday in mm-hmm. Seattle, what are we celebrating? We are celebrating that my third book of the trilogy has been published. The third in book. one year? Wow. Well, you got the first one coming first, out. First one is written. It yes. should be published by Christmas. Second one is being written. Yes. Hopefully then published maybe Q1-ish. And so That's it would be fast. published wow. by Q3. It's got to be because I'm running a little bit of a race with Mel Gibson and Jim Caviezel, oh. who are doing The Passion of the Christ 2 the yes. next three days. Yes. And my book two, a section of my book two covers that because I'm, I'm in paradise, right? So Jesus dies, comes down, and he rescues the prisoners and sets them free. He preaches condemnation to the demons. And so that time that is part of my book is also part of his movie. So, mm, when's that so, movie coming out? So, what the hell happened on Saturday? That's probably going to be part of the third book. So, the movie's supposed to come out, I think, June time frame next year. Oh, wow. I yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I'd heard they were working on it, but I didn't know it at any point that it was yeah. sad. That's my understanding. Jim Canfield, my man, thank you so much for being on the Holy Smokes podcast. I really look forward to hanging out at your place yep. next time I'm in Seattle. Thanks, Steve. It's been great talking to you.